Imagine. My painfully shy and introverted 14-year-old daughter May, the one who's always behind the scenes, singing a solo in front of hundreds of people at the Spring Chorus concert. Her sweet voice rose strong and clear as she sang, I am beautiful in every single way. She was much better than me. <laughs> Beauty, courage, and determination are not just themes of this Christine Aguilera song. They were May. Proud tears filled my vision. My daughter was transforming right in front of me. She was luminous and confident. She was beautiful. Who is after in your life? Who can drive you to be better, drive you to want to change? You may not even realize your catalyst for change. And you're right in front of you. A few days after my daughter's triumph adjusted my lens on beauty, I ran into J.P., the guy who cleans the halls at work. He excitedly told me about his upcoming events at the Special Olympics. I'm going to do the softball toss and the 100 meter walk. And that's how I've almost gone to for so many years. I've always said, I'm thrilled, JP, I should go someday. Word. Boy, that. This time is different. There was a gravitational pull. JP was putting himself out there for the world to see. It was time to break out of my comfort zone. It was time to be better. Greater. It was time to be more like my beautiful daughter. It will make your day and theirs, the email invitation read. This year I was going. Special Olympics, here I come. I had no idea what I was in for. The athletes hard work and preparation home. Imagine training for a year to walk a hundred meters. As an athlete myself, I focus on the finish line. Isn't that the prize? I neglected to see the humanity of bravery. Standing up for the lot. Before the starting line and after the finish line are strong and kind people doing extraordinary things. I had to see these athletes. I want to do something meaningful. Something good. How have I been so blind? For years, my wife Ellen has volunteered to raise funds for the special needs clients across the street. I only seem to pay attention to Louie and his friends when they not so discreetly threw treats to my dog from afar. My dog was getting fat. <laughs> and I'm just laughing because she saw the joy of David. Besides, the dog didn't seem to mind. Ellen often went to the Special Olympics to see Louie, Scott, Melvin, and others. She knew more than her name. She knew their stories and shared in their lives. I wanted to be more like my wife. More open, more kind, more giving. I wanted to be beautiful. Like her. As I approached the venue, there were tents as far as the eyes could see. State troopers handing out ribbons and medals. Contagious excitement, not just for the athletes, but for the supporters, spectators, and volunteers. Scott and Melvin showing off their awards. I saw my fat and happy dog garnering more attention than a streaker at the Super Bowl. <laughs> what I saw was unconditional joy, love, and happiness. Exuding from people whose actions screamed, I am determined, I am brave. I am beautiful. The deafening applause was just as loud as the last place athlete is for the first. On this day, everyone won. <clears throat> Including me. There's an oath that opens every Special Olympics. Let me win. But if I cannot, let me be brave in the attempt. This is what I was reacting to. In the moment where courage and determination push us forward to be better than we were before. This These seemingly unrelated acts, together, became the missing puzzle pieces that spurred my action. What started as a small white snowball with my daughter turned into an avalanche of bursting through colors that transformed me and opened my eyes. What I once looked through, I now look to for inspiration. I broke out of my comfort zone to be better, stronger, braver. I'm now a proud member of the Disability Support Group at work and a committed Special Olympics volunteer. More importantly, I found some new friends.
true beauty. Oh, they brought me the whole time. My final cow was having the next day at work. JP exploded through the door. Look at my medal. JP, I see more than your medal now. You're beautiful. Are your eyes closed to the potential beauty that may be right in front of you? What's keeping you from breaking out of your own comfort zone? What's your catalyst for change? Whether it's your daughter, <coughs> your spouse or significant other, or your own GP. Open your eyes to truth to be better, stronger, right? JP, or even what is your JP? Can you grab hold of your own transformation? You have the fortitude to do something to make a difference in your life and the lives of others. Do you even know the signs that can spur you to be better, stronger, greater? Your ability to cross over the threshold from changed thinking to changed actions may not be as far out of your reach as you think. Personal and professional success are there for the people. We all have the ability to change who we are. We need to be flexible to change. Just look at the healthcare industry with constant reform and new medical practices. For example, hands on we see PR is now hurt. People are being taught to push hard and fast to the beat of the song, staying alive, because it's supposed to have 100 beats per minute. In reality, it has 103. There is a song with 100 beats, but the medical experts are not sure they want it running through their head while you're doing it. And another one's gone, and another one's gone, and another one bites the dust. Before we get too deep into the content, I want to share with you that I'm at. I'm addicted to post message. It has changed my life and career. I've had issues with communicating and singing. Although it's done nothing for my musical prowess, it's done wonders for my ability to stop taking 20 minutes to tell a 30 second answer. Let me show you how far I've come. My wife has a nine year old niece who was overheard at school telling a classmate, You're not popular and nobody likes you. The teacher had to write a letter on the college. The letter came in the next day and said, I'm sorry. You are not popular and nobody likes you. <laughs> Today is a look back on the many milestones I've passed in my life. Some I know, some I hate. As we go through today, I want you to look back on the potential lessons learned in your life and ask yourself, did you do anything with them? It's okay if you did, because it's not too late. Let's take a moment. To think about the names of three people, animals, events, anything that can or have inspired you. Each may have a different reason for influence. Whether it's admiring someone's courage, lessons taught, or learning from your own mistakes. There's a constant in all of that to make it happen. And that's you. Up until a few years ago, I was inconsistent with my professional performance, often cynical, definitely defensive. I've been demoted twice in my career and told I would never reach senior management because they never saw me in the role. Yet I can stand in front of you today and tell you I've never been happier, personally or professionally, than I am right now. In the midst of a downturned economy, I've thrived with more raises, promotions, and increases in job responsibilities than I could have ever imagined. I'm doing things I never dreamed of, writing two books being part of the National Speakers Association, being the official announcer of the U.S. National Department Change. Why am I coming? Because it took me years to figure out that I finally got it. I needed to break out of my own painfully shining into bird shell and look myself in the mirror. I wanted and needed to change. I wanted and needed to transform. 
I never believed anything was my fault, including my limited promotions, my slow growth, and my inconsistent satisfaction. I used my defensive reaction as a protective mechanism, which impacted my ability to relate to people or communicate effectively. If you don't believe me, let me share with you some quotes from my performance appraisal from my first 20 years on the job. Tom needs to be more concise in his communication style and ensure he adapts to the audience based on who he's interacting with. He needs to ask more questions for a full understanding. He needs to position his ideas with the audience in mind. He needs to be more confident in his presentations to senior management. He needs to stop second guessing himself. He needs to avoid shutting down when others don't agree with on and on and on. I've read this a couple times. <laughs> My managers just didn't understand. They had to have been copying from my previous reviews from my former manager. It was never my fault, never my problem. That's why I took no actions to improve. I can't imagine if I was never promoted on my own time. <clears throat> Think back to the toughest feedback you ever received and ask yourself, what did you do? When you're presented with the gift of feedback, you can do one of two things. Or, or do something like that. When I first started in collections on the phone, I was an up and coming performer in an industry leading company. In just two years, I became a consistent top performer and was given my first management role. In less than a year, I dropped morale like a rock, developed poor management habits, and received devastating. Apparently, being good at your former job does not guarantee you're going to become a good leader. I had every excuse in the book. I managed 30 people on my own in a seven day a week shop with 12 hour shifts. My manager never gave me any feedback. It didn't help that I told anyone and everyone I ran into I should be paid extra for babysitting. <laughs> for the first of two times in my career, I was moved for better opportunity. Code for you've been demoted. But this isn't some hard luck story. I'm a hard working guy with raw talent just looking for a little direction. Apparently, I've waited for others to show me the map. But today is about lessons in transforming yourself. Transformation is a look back on the milestones that have enlightened you about one, self awareness. Two, belief. Believe that you can change. Three, Spur you to take the actions to change. Let me repeat that. One, self-awareness. Two, belief. Three, action. What's number one? Self-awareness. What's number two? Belief. <laughs> What's number three? Action. What's that spell? I have no idea. It wasn't intended to be an action. Spot. <laughs> Milestone one hit me like a ton of bricks. After I was moved, I realized my former team was happier, performing better, and didn't seem to miss me. Self-awareness permeated my thoughts. Maybe it wasn't me. A change was needed. I'd been in the Delaware offices for about four years, and I really wasn't that man. I was put into a closet about this big to become a computer programmer. I had no technical experience. I was miserable. I was a communication major intentionally to avoid that stuff. I heard there were new offices going into Maine. I thought I'd talk to the executives to so give me another shot at managing. I'm not sure I was ready to change. I felt that I needed to change. The executive said he didn't see any growth potential with me as a manager. I can go up there if I wanted in a business support role, but only after I talked to my new potential manager. So I guess he knew who I was. First thing he said is, Tom, do you realize you're cynical? And that's not healthy for a new and emerging business. I had never been labeled as cynical before. Sarcastic is cynical. I had a growing reputation that was coming to life. I was just smacked between the eyes with some feedback I apparently needed. Bad. I left the meeting having to look up the word. I had an idea of what it meant, but wanted a full understanding and context of how it related to me. It 
mean? A disbelief in sincerity and human motive. I was beginning to cherish these relationships. 
I needed them and they needed me. Besides, a newfound vulnerability of sharing all my mistakes and lessons learned with others was getting somewhat of a problem. I continued my roller coaster of self awareness, belief, and action. Slowly but surely, I have reached my own long term and professional goals. Not on my time, but I was moving forward until the most impactful milestone of all. While I was on vacation, 700 miles away from home, my wife's aunt walks across the yard and says, So, I understand your company's been bought. Relaxation turned attention. There was a flood of stress, worry, and uncertainty. I had no idea what was going to happen to me. I had no idea what was going to happen to the company. I was at an unintended crossroad. I had no desire to leave the company. It was the only company culture I knew and loved. Yes, several times said love. I put far too much time and energy in this place. I returned on vacation and started my new journey. Some people froze in the fear of losing their job. While others proactively dusted off the resume. I personally called a relative who worked for the new company. She had been through this just a couple years before. Her advice? Control what you can't control. She said, besides, with a company this large, there may even be more room for advancement. It sounded counterintuitive at the time. But she was right. Another couple of months. Control what I can't control, and I can thrive simply by differentiating my actions. How could my small voice influence a company this large that was constantly in flux? I started by understanding the company mission and culture. I realized this seems basic, but the old company culture was extremely strong. Instead of bringing the best of both worlds together, some people refused to accept the culture and outwardly spoke against it. I made the effort to embrace the new culture and openly spoke about the opportunities in front of us. I came to the realization the company wouldn't have survived without the acquisition. I too was very loyal and knew we had done many great things. But I became an early adapter to the new culture. I had a clean slate. Many of the people who were causing my poor memories were no longer there either by choice or by company direction. What did I have? While some people were waiting for instruction, I jumped in with both feet. Made me think of one of my favorite sayings. Opportunity seldom labels itself. I found a mentor. I became a mentor. I joined Toastmasters with a flood of new minds. Be willing to take chances. Break out of my comfort zone. Find a support system. Finally, stop taking myself so seriously. After I joined Toastmasters, it took almost two years before I practiced my first speech in front of my wife. I was on my way out the door to a speech competition in Canada, where the winner would go on to the world semifinals and be in the top 81 in the world. Seemed like a good time. <laughs> I wrote a seven-minute speech about my dog, Kevin, rescuing him. I was so nervous I did a speech in five minutes. <laughs> There's a line in there that says millions of dogs and cats. I was so tongue-tied. I said millions of dogs and a cat. <laughs> she couldn't stop laughing. She knew it was a one-time gap and knew the effort I put in to get to this point. I knew if I could do it in front of her, I could do it in front of anyone. My family's been there to provide me the feedback I needed to hear and provide me the support to move me forward. My communication skills and my confidence level and my subsequent success grew exponentially when I involved, when I involved my family, friends, and colleagues in my learning process. I'm not Perfect. That's not a monster. The fact that I'm okay with it is. I now strive to better myself versus letting everything weigh me down. In the middle of another speech competition, I was the lucky contestant to have a jackhammer going off behind him. I was thrown. Years before, I would have screamed down. Instead, I went home. 
home and I change my practice routines to encourage distraction. I now practice my speeches when the children are playing the piano, the trombone, or the xylophone. I invite the dog into the room so I can step over him while he's howling. It helps with focus and concentration. I'm even a little less passionate. I practice my speech in front of my dental hygienist while I'm waving my <laughs> All our actions to improve. It has made me more open, more bold, more confident. The opportunities in front of me are endless. My ability to adapt is made me a little bit more go with the flow and a little less likely to think about the potential negative things that can happen. I've taken the lead in my life and career. I've taken actions to improve my attitude. I've made more of a name for myself in the last four years than I had in my previous 18 combined. Personally, I'm just happy. Probably just a little easier to be around. My transformation has been slow, constantly being in a state of evolution, but I am on top of the world. How's your 2020 mindset? Can you grab hold of your own mindset? You have the luxury to look back so you can look forward. <coughs> Are you aware of your shortcomings? Do you believe that you can grow? Do you have a supporting cast to help identify your blind spots and reinforce the odds? I began to believe that I could make a difference. I proved people wrong. I proved people right. I stopped hoping. There's hope. Change is inevitable. Growth is an option. Moving from resistance to acceptance isn't easy, but it is possible. You have a choice. Do nothing or do something about it. Be vulnerable enough that people see the real you. They'll be willing to help, but more importantly, you can transform into who you really want to be. Hold yourself accountable as if you're the only person in the room. That's when you know you've made the difference. There is no such thing as wrong place at the wrong time. There's only self-awareness or self-doubt. Resistance or acceptance. But it is your choice. Your catalyst for change may be right. Transform into who you really want to be. I'd like to end with a speech that has been meant an awful lot to me. It has been one of the driving factors behind my own transformation. Are you living to die? We're dying. <coughs> We're dying to live. I was 15 years old. My buddy Jack slept over. He had a coughing fit for hours. It was deep and constant, and I never heard anything so frightening in my life. I finally woke him. He looked up with the biggest smile on his face and asked, What's wrong? He realized. He had never told me. Jack had cystic fibrosis. According to the cystic fibrosis, more than 70,000 people worldwide are affected by this chronic disease that often cuts life short. The main symptoms are thick, sticky mucus. None of us know when we're going to die. Jack knew we wouldn't make it past the age of 25. It's all the look on my face. A mixture of shock, pity, and helplessness. But he told me not to worry. Because it's not about dying. It's about living. Jack was four foot eleven with a five foot smile. He lived his life the way that we all should. Like we are dying. I never 
I saw him sad, angry, or remorseful. He carried the potential burden of an early death like with a pocket full of change. I never knew it was there until I heard the jingle. Or in this case, the call. Through high school, Jack was an active student with a zest for life, but unable to participate in sports. He took great joy in being behind the camera. He would often hand his hand to shots of our slang and would simply say, live life. He also wasn't afraid of being on the other side of the camera, where he always jumped in front of yearbook picture screaming, Is this life great? <laughs> he often introduced himself as Hank. There was no particular reason except it was amusing. Jack went to Widener University because there was too much of life to live and learn. I went to see him his freshman year. We were stopped by a campus policeman as we were walking down the street. For laughing too hard. He thought we were being mischievous. We weren't. Still suspicious, he told me to never come back again. I told Jack I would die if my parents ever found out. He laughed. It's not about them. It's about living. Jack had to leave college after a couple of years. Too many extended trips to the hospital. While many of us were waiting for our first legal beer, Jack was hooked up the tubes, planning his own funeral. Still, the signature smile never left. He never wanted to be, but he did like a good laugh. Even on the day his casket rolled up the church aisle. He had the Rolling Stones song, You Can't Always Give What You Want, Mike. I laughed and cried simultaneously for the first time ever. There was a problem. I was just handed a gift, a lesson in life in the tender age of 21. Somehow I let the speed of life over the next 20 years pass me by. There's nothing wrong with my life, just the daily life. In a hustle and bustle airport one day I heard a faint noise, a cough deep and constant like jazz. I then heard the song I heard a hundred times since his death. I heard it for the first time. Dear Tom, many things have happened between us. You don't know how scared I was that we would never talk again. After I asked Jody to the prom, thanks for not getting mad. Four foot away. And he always got the girl. I'm really glad we got to spend a lot of time together over the past couple of years. Well, I will end this, not with goodbye or good luck, but with remembrance. I opened that kid and began to live my life to the fullest. I taught myself the piano. I took up fly fishing, although terrified of heights, went up in a hot air balloon. I even wrote a book about my own professional development and transformation. You can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you just might find get what you need. I need a Jack. Even 20 years later. He lived his life to the fullest and I had wasted time. We all know that we are dying. But how many of us are truly I went to 
a takeout restaurant the other night. When they asked for my name, 